In this video, we are going to talk about the different exogenic processes. The learning competency is to describe how rocks undergo weathering. Here are our specific learning outcomes. When asked what is weathering, some will think of the changes in the weather. But this is not exactly what weathering is. However, it is part of the agents of weathering which we will talk about later. Weathering describes the breaking down or dissolving of rocks and minerals on the surface of the earth. And you have to remember that weathering happens in situ. It means it happens in place. Now there are two kinds of weathering, the mechanical weathering and the chemical weathering. Let's start with mechanical weathering. Mechanical weathering, also called as physical weathering and disaggregation, causes rocks to crumble. Okay, consider this rock. When I crush it, let's say using a hammer, I will produce smaller rocks. These smaller rocks are just like the bigger rock, but just smaller. That means the rock has changed physically without changing its composition. That's what mechanical weathering is. The smaller pieces have the same minerals in the same proportions as the original rock. And there are many ways that rocks can be broken apart into smaller pieces. So mechanical weathering can be brought to by a lot of agents. We have the ice, wind, water, gravity, plants, and animals. Let's start with what we call the frost wedging. It is the main form of mechanical weathering in any climate that regularly cycles above and below the freezing point. As you can see in this figure, frost wedging happens when water gets inside the joints, followed by alternate freezing and melting, okay, which then eventually breaks the rock. Next, we have salt crystal growth. Crystal growth occurs when groundwater moves into empty pores or spaces of rock by capillary action. Capillary action is the process of a liquid flowing in narrow spaces without the assistance of or even in opposition to external forces like gravity. So as the water evaporates, salt crystal grows and accumulates, putting pressure on the rock and causing it to break apart. Salt crystallization is common in other climates and they look like this. Next, we have abrasion. It is the wearing away of rocks by constant collision of loose particles. In abrasion, one rock bumps against another rock and this is caused by a lot of things. First, we have gravity. Gravity causes abrasion as a rock tumbles down a mountainside or cliff. Second, we have moving water. It causes abrasion as particles in the water collide and bump against one another. Next, strong winds. Strong winds carrying pieces of sand can sand blast surfaces. Last, we have ice and glaciers. So the ice carries many bits and pieces of rocks. Rocks embedded at the bottom of the glacier scrape against the rocks below. Just remember, abrasion makes rocks with sharp or jagged edges smooth and round. So this figure on the left is caused by water abrasion and on the right shows wind abrasion. Now you have to remember that mechanical weathering increases the rate of chemical weathering. Because as rocks breaks into smaller pieces, the surface area of the pieces increases. With more surfaces exposed, there are more surfaces on which chemical weathering can occur. Take note that the mechanical weathering and chemical weathering almost occur simultaneously. So meaning they happen at the same time. Now, what is chemical weathering? Chemical weathering is the other important type of weathering, which is different from mechanical weathering because the rock changes not just in the size of the pieces, but its composition. So the change is at the molecular level. And one type of mineral changes into a different mineral. Chemical weathering works through chemical reactions that cause changes in the minerals. 
Okay, so there are many types of chemical weathering because there are many agents of chemical weathering. Water is the most important agent of chemical weathering. Two other important agents of chemical weathering are carbon dioxide and oxygen. Now let's talk about chemical weathering by water. So this is the change in the composition of minerals when they react with water. So remember that a water molecule has a very simple chemical formula, H2O. So you have two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. But water is pretty remarkable in terms of all the things it can do. Okay, so remember, water is a polar molecule. So the positive side of the molecule attracts negative ions. And the negative side attracts positive ions. So water molecules separate the ions from their compounds and surround them. Hydrolysis is the name of the chemical reaction between a chemical compound and water. When this reaction takes place, water dissolves ions from the mineral and carries them away. That's why some references call it dissolution. Okay? So these elements that react with water have undergone leaching. Now let's go to chemical weathering by carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, CO2, combines with water as raindrops fall through the atmospheres which makes a weak acid called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is very common in nature where it works to dissolve rock. Pollutants such as sulfur and nitrogen from fossil fuel burning create sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Sulfuric and nitric acids are the two main components of acid rain, which accelerate chemical weathering. Now, let's talk about chemical weathering by oxygen. This is also called as oxidation. It is a reaction between minerals and oxygen dissolved in water. So oxidation is a chemical reaction that takes place when oxygen reacts with another element. For example, iron. Okay? This is because oxygen is very chemically reactive. So, oxygen plus iron will create the rust. Remember, minerals that are rich in iron break down as the iron oxidizes and forms new compounds. Iron oxide produces the red color in soils. Now, there is another type of weathering called the biological activity. Okay, so this is weathering caused by living organisms. For example, we have trees. So trees put down roots through joints or cracks in the rock in order to find moisture. So as the tree grows, the roots gradually prise the rock apart. So this is sometimes called as the root wedging. Okay, and even the tiniest bacteria, algae and lichens, produce chemicals that help break down the rock on which they live so they can get the nutrients they need. This is also the reason why biological activity is considered both physical and chemical weathering. So what are the agents of biological weathering? We have growing plant roots so they can exert stress or pressure on rock. We also have microbial activity which break down rock minerals by altering the rock's chemical composition, thus making it more susceptible to weathering. And we also have the animals. So burrowing animals can move rock fragments to the surface, exposing the rock to more intense chemical, physical, and biological processes, and so indirectly enhancing the process of rock weathering. Let's now discuss the factors that affect the type, extent, and rate at which weathering takes place. The first one is climate. Areas that are cold and dry tend to have slow rates of chemical weathering, and the weathering is mostly physical. Just remember, chemical weathering is most active in areas with high temperature and rainfall. Next, we have the rock type. The minerals that constitute rocks have different susceptibilities to weathering, okay? So those that are most stable to surface conditions will be the most resistant to weathering. Next, we have rock structure. 
Just remember that rate of weathering is affected by the presence of joints, folds, faults, and bedding planes through which agents of weathering enter a rock mass. So highly jointed or fractured rocks disintegrate faster than a solid mass of rock of the same dimension. We also have topography. Topography are the forms and features of land surfaces. So weathering occurs more quickly on a steep slope than on a gentle slope. We also have time. So the length of exposure to agents of weathering determines the degree of weathering of a rock.